So what's up everyone? I know there's always a lot happening and um, one of the things I was hoping to do with this video is to kind of again set the distraction away from everything happening in the pandemic right now and you know make a video about <laughs> studying because that's kind of what we do. Um, but I wanted to do a bit of an overlap because I wanted to show you that I don't just use Anki to study, you know, medicine related, test related stuff. I also use it a lot to study things that I want to genuinely study. So for example, uh, many of you who follow me on social media may know I've been very, very involved in keeping up to date with all the research publications regarding COVID-19, the treatment regimens, what's working, what isn't working, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the ways I'm doing that is actually with Anki. So I, you know, listen to lectures online, I make flashcards and I use those flashcards to enhance my learning. So in today's video, there's two parts. The first part, I'm just going to show you one of the ways I approach flashcards and how I do them. You'll get to look at the flashcards I've made and you know how fast I go. In the second part of this video, you'll see me do flashcards related to the COVID-19 pandemic, because as I said, um, one of the brilliant parts about medicine is that you're always learning. Um, even when something like this happens, you, you're you forced to learn. And I still use Anki for that too. So you can see how I kind of use it for pretty much everything. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and show you this video. Let me know what you think. Um, hopefully it gives you an insight because sometimes the best way to learn is to see it for yourself and see the way flashcards are made. So let's do it. What's up, everyone? So I always get a lot of requests to just Anki and show you a little bit more. So I'm just going to go ahead and do flashcards today. And you can kind of watch, follow along, uh, and we'll go from there. I'm not really even studying for step two yet, um, but I am still doing cards passively to kind of get into the groove. So that's kind of where we'll start. We'll just start with some of the cards that I work on. Um, and I'll even show you some of the other things I'm working on. So let's start with GI, since that's kind of what I was working on. I'll do these 38 cards and then I will show you the fact that I don't use Anki just to study for tests. I use it for learning of all things. So I actually then have a deck about coronavirus stuff because I'm doing a lot of research on coronavirus. I want to stay up to date on what's going on. So I'll show you my deck on that. So let's do this one first. Um, and I think for the first like 10 or so cards, I'll explain it. And then for the remainder, I'll just try to show you how fast I usually go if I know something and if I don't know something, what happens. So, all right, let's go relatively slow for the first 10. The treatment for eosinophilia. So the whole point of the past medical history of GERD is to imply that they're already on a PPI. So if you have PPI and then you have eosinophilic esophagitis, that implies that the PPI is not helping. So you would just start with steroids. Um, for someone who has ingested caustic substance, should you induce emesis? Nope, you should not because if it comes back up, it can harm the esophagus. Um, good. And so notice how I included a screenshot here of the video that this information came from. And I also included a screenshot of the actual um, notes that Online MedHead has. Um, what is the preferred treatment for achalasia? Um, I believe it is myotomy, which is you just kick into the muscle, yep. What is pill-induced esophagitis? It's when you take a pill <laughs> and it gets stuck in your esophagus, which causes inflammation. Um, yeah, perfect. For any sort of esophagitis cause, what is the way you will clinch the diagnosis? So anytime you have esophagitis, the diagnosis is usually going to be made. The underlying cause is going to be made with a biopsy. Yeah. So this is actually a hard one too, because it's saying for someone who is not a surgical candidate for a cholecystectomy and you can't give urus deoxycholic acid, which is the medical management of cholecystitis, what could you do? Well, the next one is a cholecystotomy, which is when you put in stent tubes to actually drain the fluid around the gallbladder. Um, for what condition can you give the medication? Ceftraxone. So a third generation cephalosporin plus a macrolide is usually for community acquired pneumonia. Um, for someone who has ingested a caustic substance, should you try to neutralize it? Nope, because when you neutralize it, you release an exothermic reaction, which releases a bunch of heat and can cause even more damage. I think I spelled mnemonic wrong here, but whatever. Causes of esophagitis piece. Um, I think I represents infection. Yep. Um, what is the treatment for oral thrush versus esophagitis? So oral thrush is usually treated with nystatin, which is a um, treatment that usually is limited to your oropharynx, I believe. Esophagitis usually implies that the candida that you have, the infection is systemic, so you need a systemic treatment. So that's more um, like with fluconazole, which is more of a systemic treatment that you can um, 
have effects all around your body. Whereas mystatin is mostly just in your um, oral cavity. Okay, so now that we've done about 10 together, I'm just going to go relatively fast through these next one, next few, and you'll just see my speed. So cancer presenting an echolea, pseudoechalasia. Um, is the following pressure tracing indicative of scleroderma? And this is scleroderma. Uh, what is the difference between mechanical issue and causes? So if it's a mechanical issue, I believe you you get dysphagia with mostly solids and liquids are fine. But if a motility issue, you get dysphagia with solids and liquids. Yep. What is the antiviral used to treat HSV? HSV is um, acyclovir. CMV is GAN cyclovir. This is achalasia because notice that this pressure tracing is elevated. Why should someone who had severe caustic infection remain on PO for 72 hours? Well, if you had a severe thing that you ingested, um, you have a potential for esophageal rupture if you eat anything. So yeah, there we go. Potential consequence for longstanding GERD stricture. Diffuse esophageal spasm mimics what diagnosis? MI. Oh, for someone who has esophageal rupture, why do you do routine EGDs? Because they're increased risk for cancer, because they probably have Plummer Vinson syndrome. Yep. What are two treatments for achalasia for someone who is not a candidate? Botulinum toxin and then manual expansion. For someone who has GERD develops dysphagia. So this could be a stricture because you can't eat or cancer. Yeah. Differentiate the two with the bear. How do you treat cancer of the uh, radiation and chemotherapy? Shizaki ring is like a ring at the bottom of your esophagus that prevents you from swallowing. Because always bear to swallow, right? Just making sure. Yes. Someone who has GERD. I think this is barium swallow. Yeah. Caustic injection. Increase. Cause the esophagitis. Peace. Three big motility causes of dysphagia, scleroderma, achalasia, and diffuse esophageal spasm. Is the eosinophilic. You'd manually open it up, or a PPI at a leaf, yep. Okay, great. So I didn't say much there because I primarily wanted you guys to see how fast sometimes I go. These were all cards I made, and one of the reasons I remember them better is because I made them myself. Um, but uh, just wanted to put that out there in terms of like speed. That's about the speed I usually go at. And now I want to just show you that I don't just use Anki for standardized tests. I use it for literally almost everything. Like I used it for my sub eye. I used it for my clerkship when I was learning material that wasn't related to tests. Um, and now I'm using it for coronavirus research. So whenever I watch a lecture on the coronavirus or if I have a clinical review that I look at, um, so anything like that, like I watched a ZDog MD lecture yesterday and just made Anki cards from it. So I want to show you guys some of these cards primarily because I want to show you that Anki works for everything. So how many stereotypes are there for SARS-CoV-2? There's only one so far. Um, the fastest vaccine ever so far is you, probably the mumps vaccine. So I learned this from the lecture yesterday, and that was made in about four years. Uh, what kind of vaccine is being looked at um, for SARS-CoV-2? It's actually an RNA vaccine that they're trying to look at against the spike protein. Um, how long did it take to make a rotavirus vaccine? That actually took 26 years, I believe. Yeah. Um, if you had one out of four common strains coronavirus last year and then measured your serum type this year, would you be protected? Yes. So the whole point behind this card is to show you that the immunity that we develop even against the no normal coronaviruses, not even the novel one, there's four new coronaviruses that kind of circulate throughout. Um, and that's what we usually test for when you get a respiratory panel. If you had a coronavirus strain last year and you then got serology testing this year, you probably would be protected. That's what's interesting. How long did it take to make the HPV vaccine? Even that one, I think, took around seven years. And before that, there was like years of research, right? And so, yeah, that's interesting. Antibody-dependent enhancement. So this was actually a really interesting point that was brought up in the lecture yesterday about the coronavirus vaccine from ZDOG. It was the fact that um, 
Sometimes vaccines can have bad side effects. Sometimes if you make a vaccine and it creates antibodies to not the region of interest, but to another region of a protein that isn't like, you know, the business end, what that ends up doing is that it actually increases the ability of the virus to get into cells. And that actually is bad because the whole point of a vaccine is to decrease a virus's ability to infect cells. But if you have an antibody dependent enhancement, the antibody you produce against a virus ends up facilitating viral entry. And that ends up, you know, being really bad because now you're pretty much facilitating a way for the virus to get into the cell. So that's actually something that they're worried about with the coronavirus vaccine. So they don't want that to happen. Um, and so you'll see, I kind of have that same question again. What in theory would be a way for an RNA va What in theory would be the way an RNA vaccine for the coronavirus would work? Well, basically they would inject the RNA for the S protein into people and that S protein would then get translated from the mRNA and that S protein would then induce an antigenic response, which then if you got hopefully infected with this coronavirus, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the antibodies would bind to the S protein and prevent that S protein from interacting with the receptor and actually um, uh, entering the cells. So that's, that's in theory what they're thinking right now. What is the average number of deaths weekly? Um, before the pandemic. So this was actually a really interesting point that was brought up in the lecture last yesterday. It was before the pandemic kicked in to the US, we were having 55,000 deaths a week. And now we're having 45,000. And that's primarily because even though the deaths from the coronavirus are going up, we are staying inside, we're being safer, people aren't dying from car accidents. So there's all these other causes of death that are not factoring in right now. And so what the, the lecturer made a point of saying yesterday, which I thought was amazing, um, is that even though we are seeing more deaths from coronavirus, our overall health as a nation is increasing because fewer people, quote unquote, are, are passing away from other causes aside from the coronavirus. Um, and is hepatitis A a killed vaccine? It is indeed, yeah. And this was another point that was brought up yesterday. And I already knew this. It's just a reaffirming point for me. Um, so that's just one lecture. We can go through one other one so you guys can kind of see my general gist of the fact that even though it's not related to medical school, I'm still learning. So let's see. I watched a UCSF lecture the other day, and it went through pretty much everything you knew about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so I made entourage about it. So let me show you. So, so I don't know if you guys know this, but the way we measure acute respiratory distress syndrome is through the PaO2 or FiO2 ratio. And usually when that ratio is less than 300, someone has ARDS. But when that ratio starts to get below 150, that's when you start considering prone positioning with intubation. Um, and so that's kind of what the point was here. What percent of COVID-19 patients have fever on admission? I think it's about 50% have fever on admission, but about 70 to 80% end up having fever throughout their hospital course. Um, and so you'll see right here, I even took a screenshot from the presentation. Um, the, ch the measures that China implemented that decreased are not value from what to what. So in China, the transmission from one person to another was around three, like one person could infect three people. But when they implemented all of their measures, they actually got it down to 0 0.32, which was fantastic. And it showed you that their social isolation or social distancing worked pretty well. It was, playing with, on, it was being placed on a ventilator, a good sign or a bad sign. And this is in reference to the SARS-CoV-2 virus because it's in my SARS-CoV-2 deck. And it's actually a very bad sign. Almost everyone who's placed on a ventilator, like almost 80% of them end up passing away. Um, and you'll see, I even included a slide right here on that. And you'll see that non-survivors, you know, they're placed on a ventilator and then they end up passing away. Um, and hey, this is something I just talked to you guys about, but PaO2 over FI2 ratio less than 300 is diagnostic of ARDS. Um, and you'll see, this was from a report of the CDC that said, even in the US, even though 65 plus made up 31% of the cases, they made up over like 80% of the mortality. Um, and so that was really frustrating. Um, this the 1918 influenza pandemic demonstrated that social distancing, if you don't have it active throughout the pandemic, you will get the disease back. So, you know, this lecture made it a point that even if the disease seems to be going down, if we don't maintain social distancing, it will come back up. And that's kind of shown here where if you don't implement social distancing, you have one wave of death and then, you know, you think everything's fine and then you have another wave of death. Um, we already answered that. And then Eletra. And this is another kind of flashcard I always like to make. If there's a medication that I like know the name of, but I don't know the trade name of, I'll make a flashcard about it. And so this one is actually about lopinavir and lo, lo, lotinavir. No, lopinavir and rotinavir. 
Yeah. And these are both protease inhibitors. Um, the R0 of whooping cough, whooping cough is severely um, transmissible. I think it's at least 16. Yeah. I think it's about 500 milligrams twice a day. That's like right now, no one is saying chloroquine works, but I think that they're saying if we were to try it out, the general dose would be 500 milligrams twice a day. Uh, the fluid that builds up is high or low protein. It's high protein. Okay, great. So now you guys can kind of onkeed with me. You saw a little bit of how I function in terms of, you know, learning new material, learning material outside of medicine that isn't necessarily related to step. Um, hopefully this also shows you some of the ways I make my questions, how I annotate each card, how the fact that I always have a little detail underneath the answer, I add in relevant slides, um, and also kind of gave you some insight into my speed. I feel like when I make videos, I can never go my full speed because I always feel the need to explain. But if you guys want to see a video where I am going full speed, it just would not include me talking and you just see me going ham. So if you're interested in that, let me know. I don't think it'd be that insightful. But aside from that, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, drop a like, comment, share, subscribe, let me know what you think. Sometimes the best way to learn is to observe someone doing what it is that you want. And hopefully with Anki, the more you see videos like this, the more you can see the ways questions should be asked, the more you should be able to realize the way questions can be answered and how they can be effectively made into flashcards. And so with that, thanks for watching. Like, comment, share, subscribe. See you in the next one. Peace.